The Hydrovac, or should I call it the Hypervac, is so simple, so much simpler than the Hyperloop. Recently, the Hyperloop demonstrated just how easy it is to build hundreds of miles of vacuum tunnel. Built as the fastest way to cross the surface of the Earth, Hyperloop represents the greatest leap in transport infrastructure for generations. Well, what if you could use that exact same system, not to transport people, but to generate an infinite amount of clean, free power? The principle of the Hydrovac is simple. Water evaporates into a vacuum to give something called a vapor pressure. If the water is then condensed, water travels from point A to point B at almost the speed of sound. A point that can be vividly demonstrated by actually making one of these devices and cooling one of the bulbs down to about minus 50 Celsius. However, once you immerse this flask at minus 40, the water will instantly freeze on here and the vapor pressure on this one will go to zero, which means the, the gas will absolutely scream across. There we go, tap is fully open. Let's see what this does for us. Boom, look at that! Goes absolutely ballistic almost instantly. This supersonic gas can then be used to spin turbines. Well, great news. The world has huge areas at this sort of temperature, minus 50, that sort of thing. They're called the poles. And great news, the world has large areas of water called oceans. All you need is a hyperloop tube connecting one to the other, and boom, instant free renewable power. I'm kind of broke, bro. Yeah, no kidding. The economy is in the toilet. Do you realize how many thousands of jobs this could create and sustain? Talk about a hypodermic adrenaline shot to the heart of the manufacturing and infrastructure sector. And it pays for itself. It's gonna be here sooner than you think. Well, that's what I claimed in my scam starter, which thankfully didn't raise the hundred or so thousand dollars I asked for to build a power generating version. But why isn't this actually a good idea? When I could actually build in real space, not some computer graphics, I could actually build a working one of these in the lab. You see, there are actually a lot of true details here. If you have water with vapor pressure at one end and zero vapor pressure at the other, because it's at minus 50 Celsius or something, then the water vapor moves from one end to the other at about the speed of sound. Because all gas molecules move at about the speed of sound. And so if you make it so they can't really slow down in one direction, because they're all being stuck to the side of the minus 50 vessel, the gas moves from one direction to the other at about the speed of sound. And you can use that fast moving gas to spin a turbine, which in principle you could hook up to a generator and generate electricity with this. So why is it so impractical? Well, oddly enough, for many of the same reasons that the Hyperloop is so impractical. Building these really big vacuum systems is bloody expensive. The great irony, of course, being, is it would be much cheaper to build one of these hypervacs than a Hyperloop. Firstly, because you can put bends in it relatively easily. Sure, not big bends if you want to maintain a laminar flow or something, but it's not like you're running Hyperloop capsules, giant Hyperloop capsules that weigh 30 tons down this thing at about the speed of sound, such that any slight deviation in the track will result in a 30-ton capsule going through the wafer-thin wall and turning all of the passengers into chunky salsa. So yeah, this would be so much easier than building a Hyperloop. But let's just briefly assume that we've got our vacuum tunnel that goes from the ocean to the North Pole. Why won't it work? Well, pretty much for the same reason that the water seer would never work. Water seer uses the environment around it to extract water from the atmosphere. The water seer device is planted about six or more feet into the ground. The metal sides of the underground chamber are cooled by the surrounding soil. Wind spins a helical turbine, fan blades that direct air into a condensation chamber. As the warmer air cools in the chamber, the water vapor condenses onto the sides. Clean, safe, pure water can be extracted from the reservoir through a simple hose and pump. 
You see, to turn water from liquid into gas takes a colossal amount of energy. A point that everyone's aware of in that a kettle is more or less a constant power device. That heater turns out a steady rate of heat. And everyone knows that it takes a relatively short period of time to heat that water from say room temperature up to boiling compared to how long it takes to boil that kettle dry. The calculations are trivial to do. The energy it takes to heat one kilo of liquid water from freezing point to boiling point takes about 400,000 joules. The energy it takes to take that same water at 100 degrees Celsius and turn it into steam at 100 degrees Celsius is about 2 million joules. And while we're on the subject of numbers, because this is going to be really relevant, the energy it takes to turn water ice at 0 degrees Celsius and turn it into liquid water at 0 degrees Celsius is about 300,000 joules. So, well, from this we can see if we have one kilo of steam at 100 degrees Celsius and turn it into water at 100 degrees Celsius, and we wanted to do that using melting ice, then we would need about 10 kilos of ice to condense one kilo of steam. And those values, it turns out, don't greatly change with temperature. So if you've got one kilo of water vapor at room temperature and want to condense it to liquid water at room temperature, you will have to melt about 10 kilos of ice to do it. And that's why the water sear would never work. You see, initially, if you have cool soil and you pump your hot air in, great. The water starts to condense on the side. But then, after a relatively short period of time, what you find is the heat of that condensation just heats up the side of the vessel and it doesn't condense water anymore. The condensing water simply heats up the area around it till it's at the same temperature as the incoming air. So how would this work with the hydrovac? Well, what you've got is a vacuum tube and you spray water in one end and it evaporates and the gas shoots down the other end and as it shoots down to the other end, it's going to spin a turbine which is going to generate the electricity. Then when it gets to the other end, it's going to hit the cold surface where it's going to condense back to water. But as it condenses, it's going to dump a load of heat into the ice. And that's going to warm up the ice. And once it gets to room temperature, all you've essentially got is a big vacuum tube with water at both ends and nothing is going to happen. Now, there are actually ways you can get around this. The most obvious is you sort of stick the condensation part at the bottom of a melting glacier where there is a constant supply of zero degrees Celsius water. Well, that's not bad. However, it turns out that even at freezing point, water has a significant vapor pressure. You see, for this thing to work at maximum power, what you need is 100% vapor pressure of water at one end, which is what you're going to get off water in a vacuum. And at the other end, you want it to be as cold as possible, such that the vapor pressure is as low as possible at the other end. That way, you're going to get the maximum flow down this tube. However, even at zero degrees Celsius, water still has a vapor pressure of about five millibar. It's not so good. What you need is for that end to be really cold. This is why with my version of the Hydrofac, when I just cool one end with ice, it works, but it's not so great. This is room temperature water, by the way. Nothing special about this at all. Now, what happens when I cool this down a bit? So this is just, I'm putting a little bit of ice on, on this vessel and There you go. However, when I cool it to minus 40, it goes like a train. However, once you immerse this flask at minus 40, the water will instantly freeze on here and the vapor pressure on this one will go to zero, which means the, the gas will absolutely scream across. There we go. Tap is fully open. Let's see what this does for us. Boom, look at that goes absolutely ballistic almost instantly.
Okay, so how about this? I get some massive heat exchangers that just pump some coolant around giant radiator fins that cool it down to the Arctic air temperature at minus 40. And then I pump that liquid around the end of my tube. So the end of my tube is essentially at minus 40. I mean, let's just ignore the construction costs for a moment. Will that solve our problem? Well, not quite. The first thing that's going to happen is that as ice condenses, ice is actually a pretty good insulator. So the surface temperature of the ice will very rapidly rise till it's at zero degrees Celsius at freezing point, at which point you're back to the original problem that the hydrovac is just not going to be that efficient. The second problem that you're going to get is that the inside of your cold end of the chamber is just going to fill up with a giant block of ice. Now, even that's not impossible to get around with some nice sophisticated airlocks and the such like that you can maybe swap out the big ice blocks, shift them out, stick a new end on the vacuum chamber and so on. Uh, but you can see why what on paper is actually a perfectly fine and workable machine in practice comes out with quite a lot of practical difficulties. Now it's true that engineering is strewn with examples where people have come up with machines that are just riddled with practical difficulties, like the internal combustion engine. Uh, the, the technical challenges you have to overcome to get that thing to work are phenomenal. I mean, most obviously, you've got a flame burning at about 3000 degrees Celsius in the middle of your engine. How do you stop it from melting your engine? Compression, power, exhaust. Now think about the engine in your car. All the explosions are synchronized together to make that one constant engine roaring sound. But at the end of the day, you can still make such machines. But some problems you just can't solve with a clever little bit of heat flow. Building hundreds of miles of vacuum tube will never be economically viable. <laughs> Trust me, I know my vacuum chambers almost as well as I know my thermodynamics, and even the little ones are a pain in the ass to maintain. But even if that wasn't true, the hydrovac still wouldn't work. I mean, let's just say I've got a millibar vacuum in this chamber before I inject the water, which would be an outstanding vacuum for such a machine. But that's about the proposed running pressure of the Hyperloop. That means about one part in a thousand of this chamber is regular air. So what's going to happen is initially all the water is going to rush down to one end and it's going to start condensing. But as it condenses, it's going to leave the air molecules, which are going to build up and eventually create a barrier of 20 millibar pressure air between the cold condensing surface and the water vapor. Now, will it still work? Yes, but diffusion is a death slow process compared to condensation. <laughs> a giant machine like this would just grind to a halt in seconds. But what if we built a much smaller system, not something that runs hundreds of miles to the North Pole or something, but a much more limited system that just ran a tube up the side of a mountain to where it's cold. And now let's just assume that we can pump the tube down, which is in itself expensive, and we've got the tube insulated everywhere where it needs to be insulated. And let's assume that we've got all the infrastructure in place for running the heat exchangers and extracting the ice. How much potential power could this thing generate? And let's just say the gas travels more or less at supersonic speeds from point A to point B. So a kilo traveling at the speed of sound contains about 54,000 joules. And let's be generous and say that this thing runs at 10% efficiency. So that means that we're going to get about 5,000 joules out of one kilo of water. Well, your average American gets through about 10,000 kilowatt hours per year, some 45 billion joules. But we're going to go for one of the other first worldly type nations because it's going to make the maths simpler. So the typical first world country uses about 5,000 kilowatt hours per year, which is about 18 billion joules or about 5 million joules per day. Yep, I told you to simplify the maths. That means that your typical Western person gets through enough energy to boil about two and a half kilos of water per day. Well, you gotta bear in mind that there are six billion people on the planet. 
So how much ice would you have to condense to supply just one person with all of their energy needs? Well, 5 million joules per day at about 5,000 joules per kilo means you're going to have to condense about 1,000 kilograms of ice. One ton of ice per person per day. Give or take, that's about a cubic meter of ice. More or less the entire size of one of those ice fridges that you get in a supermarket. Which maybe doesn't sound so bad until you think about doing this for a, a reasonable sized place near the mountains. Say for instance, Denver. They've got some nice mountains in the background. There's about half a million people in Denver. So you would have to condense about half a million tons of ice per day. Further, there are issues with the water consumption. Your typical American gets through almost half a ton of water per day, which is kind of on the high side across the world. Nonetheless, even at that, you would be about tripling your water consumption per person. Although technically you're getting the water back in one way, shape or form in that once it goes on top of the mountain, it's eventually going to melt and come back down again. And yes, it's true that you could spin this as you're going to rebuild the glaciers by pumping ice to the North Pole or on top of glaciers, or you're going to use the cooling here to run air conditioning for people and so forth. Indeed, arguably the best way to get the energy out of the water vapor is already in use. You just wait for the water to evaporate in the environment and then it condenses and falls down on top of the mountains. You collect it in reservoirs and then run it through turbines. Or even better, you just wait for the atmosphere to heat up in some places and cool down in others. And as the air moves from one place to the other, you put some wind turbines. Indeed, the Hydrovac is a little more than a fancy version of this. It just requires many more billions of dollars of infrastructure to build. So what was the point of all this? Well, in part, to highlight how a really stupid idea, which has a few kernels of solid science, can be made to sound plausible. And if you're thinking, no, it couldn't. All that poor gullible people are the only people who can be duped out of their money. You're wrong. What you're looking at here is Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. This is Kickstarter for rich people. You think that duping people out of merely a few million dollars for something which the most superficial research would show is really, really dumb. It raised over a million Aussie dollars on Kickstarter. Shut up and take my money. And not to be outdone, almost two million dollars on Indiegogo. Hold my beer, says Elizabeth Holmes. The Walton family, founders of Walmart, put up $150 million. Media mogul Rupert Murdoch stumped up $125 million. Yep, Theranos did for billionaires. Uh, what Skorkel did, but for thousands of times more money. The DeVos family, as in Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, sunk $100 million into the Theranos vision all to make this woman the youngest self-made female billionaire on the planet, based on what was essentially bogus promises like the one I made in my original Hydrovac video. Her company at its peak was worth about $10 billion. Now it's worth $0 billion. And if you think that's a rounding error, no, it's worth $0. I'll do a video on it sometime because quite frankly, it's amazing. It puts the Juicero pulling in $120 million for this to shame. And the great irony about all of this is that if I was less knowledgeable about this sort of thing, I might actually believe that I had stumbled on some great world energy solving device. And for certain, if I was less scrupulous, or how shall I say, if I was more reluctant to make the bombastic claims that are the absolute core of every single viral Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, right. They fire up the engines, they pull the supports down, so this stays completely in the same place, but there's all this magnetism that's saving everybody while the earth is shaking wildly under it. The earth is like, okay, I'm done. The supports come back up, everything's good. So we were like, of course, you could probably, with a million engines, lift anything, but that's got to cost a fortune. $13.10. That's what we're talking about. 
what it would take to hover a house energy-wise. No kidding. The economy is in the toilet. Do you realize how many thousands of jobs this could create and sustain? Talk about a hypodermic adrenaline shot to the heart of the manufacturing and infrastructure sector. And it pays for itself. You may think it's too good to be true, but here I am sitting on the proof. This chair is made from air carbon, a material that's doing its part to protect the Earth's ever-warming climate. Hyperloop represents the greatest leap in transport infrastructure for generations. A South Korean designer claims to have invented an oxygen mask which can draw air from water as you swim. Called Triton, the mask is a mouthpiece respirator that allows users to breathe underwater simply by biting on the mouthpiece. How does never having to fill your car with gas again sound? By simply replacing your engine with a system that runs on thorium, one of the densest materials known to man, you'll only need to refuel once a century. There is a real chance that I could have raised millions of dollars off of this. Sadly, that's not the case. I don't scam people out of money. I expose people who make these bogus claims that they're going to solve world energy crises with magic beans. This week's cute little science toy is a humidifier. Uh, and so what it does is it creates a, a nebulized water, which you can see there, uh, scattering the laser light, and it's got a fan. And the reason these are quite fun is you can actually see all of the heat flow on the thermal camera here. So down at the bottom you've got the nebulizer and a fan. And you see it's generating heat at the bottom to run all of that, but the, this seems to be a little cool, and uh, this is one of the cute little demos you can do, is you turn the, the nebulizer off, or right down, and it, the, the, the paper's just going to show us where the hot things are, so just a little demo, if I put my hand behind the uh, paper, you can see where the hot stuff is. And if I move that into the the exhaust here you can see that it's actually putting out heat however if i then turn that to nebulize you'll see that it instantly gets cold and what's more if i now shake it once it's got a bit of nebulized water on it it gets even colder and it keeps on getting colder until all that water is evaporated off so you see it starts seeing it evaporating here now and It'll take a few seconds and eventually you'll get back to a homogeneous piece of paper again. So I actually got these things some time ago to test the efficiency of the various claims here I was hearing about these things acting as coolers. And as coolers locally they're pretty good. You put your hand in there and it's refreshingly cool. But for cooling the whole room forget about it. These things just cannot evaporate enough water. And this humidifiers with a full reservoir for a single room, they're actually pretty good. So if you like that sort of thing, I'll leave some Amazon affiliate links below. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you don't want to miss out on the largest debunking video of all time, $10 billion, hit that subscribe button and definitely ring the notification bell. And last but not least, if you appreciate these videos, you can support this channel directly through Patreon, and I'll leave the links below.